Hi, welcome back to Sam's Math Adventures. This is episode 2B because episode 2 ended up being really long. I just kept talking about rings. Um, but I have more I want to talk about, which I think is a good thing. Uh, it shows that I'm interested in what I'm vlogging about, at least, even if no one else is uh, yet to find out. So, I spent the first video talking a lot about Nathan Jacobson, or more specifically, Jacobson rings. Um, and it reminded me of an article I read, talking about how it was ridiculous that so many things in maths are named after their inventors, because um, they, they felt like it made the language unclear. Uh, so they were like, well, it's a bit ridiculous because uh, Calabi Yao manifold is just, a, I believe it's a Kala manifold that's richy flat, possibly. I can't remember off the top of my head, but this was the example they used. And then a Kala manifold was another type of manifold, blah, 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 blah. Uh, richy flatness is to do with the Riemann tensor. Uh, it's, it's understandable, the idea that things are so buried and, you know, you can't, just extract the meaning of something from the name but something like the Jacobson ring named after Nathan Jacobson who uh, has a legacy surviving today I mean he also has a series of books he's written but I think mainly remembered for the ring and not for the books or the radical and the type of ring so what word would there be that would sum up everything that a Jacobson ring is in one word without having to use his name. Uh, I, I can't think of one. And I was, I was talking to my girlfriend about this because I splurge out lots of my maths talk to her. Um, and, and she said, yeah, well, it's, uh, you, it's sensible to use people's names because otherwise you end up with stupid words like quark and that leads us into the next part of this video or the next part of this episode um, so quark a quark is a subatomic particle that makes up a proton or a neutron or many other things uh, if you're watching this channel you probably have already heard about that um, and they were invented by Murray Gell-Mann uh, in sort of 1961, I'm going to say. Um, and the name is weird. It's a weird name. Uh, it's not quite a name that he invented. Um, it comes from a sort of... James Joyce book called Finnegan's Wake, which had the phrase three quarks for muster mark. Sure he has not got much of a bark, and sure any he has it's all beside the mark, which is it's sort of a bit nons nonsensical. Um, but we had three quarks and at the time Murray Gelman had three quarks, now there's six quarks. Um, but we had three quarks. Uh, so three quarks, four muster mark, three quarks. He, he came up with the idea that they would be called quarks and it caught on. But then that got me talking about Murray Gell-Mann uh, and his invention of quarks, which I think is really, it's the peak of theoretical physics in terms of how incredibly successful he was incredibly quickly. Uh, Obviously, there have been many great, great constructions in theoretical physics, stuff like general relativity, but Einstein wrote general relativity down in sort of 1915. And at the time, it was very good for explaining results that had already been seen. So it sort of, it fit the data. Um, it explained the procession of perihelion of mercury. It explained that might be it. Uh, there are other like classical tests of general relativity that I probably just can't remember. But it, it fit that sort of data very well. But some of the bolder claims, uh, gravitational lensing, gravitational redshift, gravitational waves, black holes, they were not testable in 1915. 
uh, it was 2016, 2017 by the time gravitational waves were detected. Um, whereas the quark model uh, John Mann came up with, it fitted, fit all the data perfectly or well enough and it made a prediction and that prediction was correct um, and it was found two years later. So there are, we're going to ignore the heavier three quarks and we're going to say there's three quarks. There's an uptight quark, a downtight quark and a strange quark. Um, John Mann didn't know this. He knew about, uh, or everyone knew about composite particles, which uh, people felt like had to have some stub structure because there were just too many of them. There were mesons, which are combinations of a quark and an antiquark in a pair and baryons, which are three quarks or three antiquarks bound together. And people had discovered many, many of these. Um, something like, I think at the time, around, I wanna say 17 baryons were known of and 17 mesons. So that's 34 particles and that's a lot of particles. And Murray Man felt, well, there's, there's similar enough that there must be substructure, right? In the same way that there's 118 elements now or something like that but there's a lot of, there's enough pattern in that that you feel like they can't be 118 completely different things and it turns out they are 118 ways of combining protons neutrons and electrons more than 118 because if we vary isotopes then we have way more there's thousands um, probably not thousands maybe a thousand We'll say a thousand. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I should have researched more. Anyway, so he had his sort of quark periodic table and he, he tried to work out how to explain these. So let's swap over. Here we go. So what I have here is called the JP half plus octet of baryons. Now, what does that mean? It means that they all have spin one half. Uh, this was known uh, either from directly measuring them with sort of protons and neutrons or seeing them in decay processes and what they decayed into, seeing them in resonances, um, which I'm not gonna get into because this is not a particle physics lecture course. This is just me fanboying over Murray Gell-Mann. Uh, and we knew their masses, uh, again, from resonances, and we knew their lifetimes. So the proton has a lifetime of roughly infinity. The neutron has a lifetime, not particularly long, but much longer than everything else. It. So we're going to start with these eight. Uh, so we've got the proton, which is composed of an up, up, two up quarks and a down quark. It's got a charge of plus one and this thing called the strangeness. Um, Basically, John Mann noticed um, that things fit nicely if we had this degree of freedom called strangeness, where normal matter, so protons and neutrons, uh, pions as well, if we're looking at mesons, are not at all strange. Uh, they're normal, ordinary matter that we, we knew about before we started smacking things together in particle colliders and looking at cosmic rays. Um, and then we have these things arranged in this hexagon and it's really nice because things in the same row have the same strangeness which is actually minus one times the number of strange quarks uh, it's just a convention that was there when it was invented and is still there now uh -huh. and along diagonal lines we have the same electric charge um, and then we have masses and all my masses here are written in MeV over C squared. Um, so the proton and the neutron, very, very similar. Um, difference of one part in a thousand, nearly. Um, still quite similar for the sigma baryons. So the sigma minus sigma naught, sigma plus. And then the psi baryons, again, similar, a bit different. And there is a formula that you can use that basically it uses only I think two or three parameters and it fits the masses of all these pretty well. Um, 
but those were those were not the only baryons. Uh, we also had another how many is that nine baryons, uh, and these were JP equals three over two plus. Um, so they've got a spin three halves, which means that all three quarks in them are sort of have spins aligned, and because of that, due to various symmetry things between the quarks. It allows us to have things like the triple down quark and the triple strange triple up quark. Um, so we had the delta baryons, uh, so three down quarks, uh, three up quarks, two up, two down quarks and up quark, two ups and a down, three ups. Then we had the sigma stars. Um, they have the same quark content if we scroll up as the sigmas, but they they have higher masses um, by sort of about two hundred MeV. And so they're sort of excitations of the sigma baryons. And again, we have excitations of the xi baryons down here. And we, we do have the same relations that everything along this line has the same charge. And everything along in a row has the same strangeness. Um, now, this has a missing spot. Um, I mean, you can't really see it if I hadn't drawn it in because you think, well, maybe it's just a tetrahedron because, you know, there's, why did we have a hexagon here and not continue it out to be a kite, right? And it's, it's to do with representation theory. Um, and so SU3, which is uh, sort of, unitary it's kind of like rotations but in three complex dimensions and it basically tells us that we can sort of treat up down and strange as the same not quite there's a slight difference because the strange is heavier also obviously charge stuff but mass wise the up and the down quark are very similar and then the strange is slightly heavier um, so we expect an su3 symmetry and so we want representations of su3 well, there aren't any nine-dimensional ones, but there is a ten-dimensional one, um, at least with irreducible representations. Um, so, Gelman decided, well, there there must be a missing particle, uh, which he called the omega minus. It goes down here. It has a strangeness of negative two, um, which is something you can measure because in most processes so everything apart from weak processes strangeness is conserved um, you can't you can't get rid of strange quarks um, without using strange anti-quarks to do that apart from in weak interactions um, and this is sort of very strong interaction dominated stuff and so he supposed strangeness of minus three sorry silly me uh, would be three strange quarks uh, then he noticed that the rows of the, it's called the baryon decouplet, have pretty much the same masses everywhere across the row. Um, basically because of the increased symmetry between the states, because we have all three spin up, we can, we have less variation in the mass. Um, so these are all 12, 32 MeV. These ones are all around 13, 85 MeV. Um, and these ones are both 1530 MeV, more or less, to the nearest MeV, I think. So if you take that, then you expect a gap of, if we average it out, 154 MeV down to here, which would give an omega mass of 1684 uh, MeV. And so that's what Murray Gell-Mann said in... 1961 and then three years later in 1964 it was discovered at 1672 MeV so that's a difference of one part in 200 um, which was really incredible uh, sort of to make such a prediction and then to have it be 
so quickly confirmed because not only did it fit all the data you had, it predicted something and that prediction was found and verified so quickly afterwards. Um, so that's sort of why when I think about sort of the most successful bit of theory, this is what I go to. Um, obviously there are there are other very important things. Uh, the anomalous magnetic moment of the electron. Uh, the theoretical and experimental results agree to some part thing like one part in 10 to the 12 and the two most recent values of that were published the sort of the theoretical one and the experimental one which agree ridiculously well were both published within a month or two i think um and so that's very you know good but to be fair they weren't doing any new physics they were just calculating these from old physics um, so this is this is my favorite physical prediction um, okay that's that's enough from me now because I've been speaking for about 50 minutes um, thank you for joining me for my maths adventure and I'll see you next time